But today, if you have your Bibles, uh, grab them, turn in them to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. We're uh, completing our series in the book of Habakkuk uh, entitled Habakkuk, Trusting God in Troubling Times. Trusting God in Troubling Times. And we've been hearing question upon question upon question from Habakkuk. And today we get his third question this morning. Um, but as you're turning to Habakkuk 3, uh, I just want to uh, uh, point out to you something that maybe, uh, maybe you've recognized. Maybe you've uh, seen it not only in yourself, but also in others. There's a whole lot of wrong views about God in the world, aren't there? Uh, so many different wrong views, and even among Christians so oftentimes. Whether it was uh, they were taught bad theology growing up, or maybe they read things in Scripture that scared them, or things that worried them, or things that they had never known were there, and because they didn't understand it, or it wasn't taught to them in proper context, um, they, they had wrong views of God. Maybe some of you had some of these, right? That God was a cosmic killjoy, right? Anybody have that? Uh, you, you grew up thinking, or maybe you still do, that God doesn't want you to have any fun. He's all about just killing anytime you smile, anytime you're happy. He's just about taking you down and making sure he's rubbing your face in it, right? Or, or maybe some of you uh, felt like God was a kid up in heaven with a magnifying glass, and you're the ant that he's trying to like uh, just burn and, and send into smithereens, right? Uh, God, the, uh, the, the, the crazy kid with the uh, magnifying glass, or, or maybe uh, just God is like some angry ogre in the sky, right? He's always angry, and I've got to do whatever I can just to keep that angry ogre off of my back and out of, from meddling in my life. Or maybe you uh, even shake your fist at the skies like Bruce Almighty did and, uh, when uh, Bruce Nolan said, Smite me, almighty smiter, right? And that's your vision of who God is, just one who smites, right? And he's smiting, 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 and one day you may get smote, right? And that's what you've been thinking about God. All these wrong views of God have led us to questions, and they lead us to questions. And they lead us even to question uh, God's word, or God's scriptures, or God's character even. And it's led you to say things like, is God good? Is God truly good? In his nature, especially when we're dealing with the problem of evil. And I see the problem of evil in our world. How can God still be good? Or can God really be trusted? If God acts in these ways, if he's like this, can God really be trusted? Or maybe you're just asking the question that Habakkuk was asking today. Will a holy God show mercy? Can a God who is perfect in holiness and pure in righteousness and altogether beautiful and good, can he allow sin in this world? Can he use sinners? And in, if, if he is that God that we've been hearing about and learning about, that he punishes sin and he's one who will bring a judgment against the wicked and bring a justice to them, will God show mercy to anyone? And can a holy God truly show mercy and still be holy? And still be faithful to that holy character. Will a holy God show mercy? Friends, Habakkuk brings his third question to the Lord this morning in a prayer. In a prayer that is amazing for us to read and behold and dive into. And, and we see that our, or our complaints before the Lord and our questions before the Lord become confidence. And ultimately turn into a chorus of chords of praise. And so today, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles. Habakkuk chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says this. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And this prayer that Habakkuk begins, this prayer that he cries out, this prayer that he's actually recording and writing for the children of Israel, writing for the, 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 the people who will be left, writing even for the captives who would hear it. He is writing this prayer before the Lord, and he's saying the very song that we sang this morning, and the song we'll sing at the end of the message this morning. Lord, I've heard of your fame. 
and I stand in awe of your deeds and everything you've done. Oh, Lord, will you renew those things in your time, in our day? Will you do those things again? And literally Habakkuk is saying, when he says, I've heard of your fame, I've heard of your work, he's saying, would you show your power once again? And he is saying, God, in the midst of your wrath, as you, as a holy God, bring justice and bring judgment against sin, in the midst of that wrath, will you please, Lord, will you please have mercy? Can a holy God, will a holy God show mercy to sinners? And that's the question he has. And interestingly enough, Habakkuk is actually uh, hearkening back to the words of, of Moses, the words of Moses that Moses sang to the people and sang over the people of Israel, the second generation of the Israelites who were about to go into the promised land, but Moses could not join them. And so he was singing a song about the character of God and the, uh, and the history of God and his people. And he says this in verse 35 of, of chapter 32, he says this, vengeance is mine. This is the Lord speaking. Vengeance is mine and recompense. For the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining bond or free. The prophet Habakkuk is remembering these things that Moses said. He's remembering the deeds that Moses spoke of and recounted before the people. And he is crying out saying, God, Moses said that you were a God of compassion. That you would look at your people and you would show them mercy. And you would fight on their behalf and overtake their enemies who assail, assail them. Father, I'm crying out to you. God, we're calling out to you and asking that in the midst of your wrath, in the midst of the discipline from your hand, that at some point, Lord, you will bring forth a heart of mercy. You will let that compassion, that graciousness, that mercy that we know is part of your character, you will let it come forth. And it will be in our day, in our time, and that you would make it known to us. He's saying, with all this sin that is around, Lord, with the sin of my people and the community that I've been seeing in chapter 1 and all of the sinfulness that I was crying out to you saying, God, why don't you do something? And you said you would. And then you said you were bringing in Babylon, this wicked and evil nation, more wicked than Judah. And, and I was saying to you, why would you do that? And how could you possibly use this more sinful nation to come and be a hand of judgment to your people? And he's saying, in the midst of all of that sin, a holy God in his justice and in, in the purity of his righteousness must bring uh, justice and judgment to that sin. He said, if that is the true character of who you are, if you are holy, would you really remember mercy? But that question is also a prayer, a pleading, saying, God, will you have mercy? Will you show mercy when there's all of this sin? And friends, the rest of this chapter is, is a cry saying, yes, yes. It's a cry from the Lord saying, yes. I will show mercy. And in fact, the Lord shows Habakkuk this vision. He gives him this vision for him to see. And he shows them what is to come. And he reminds him of his work throughout history. And he reminds him how the Lord uh, has done good deeds to his people. And he says, yes, yes, I will have mercy because God is a majestic warrior and a merciful savior. God is a majestic warrior and a merciful Savior. Now, friends, we're going to go into verses 3 through 15, all right? And as we go into there, it is very important that we look with eyes of understanding and have some foundations for our understanding as we get into this, okay? Because some of these things that are said may seem very random. Like, why did you see these things about Habakkuk, why did the Lord show these things to you? Or why did you mention these specific things? They feel kind of random. But you have to understand two different things that are going on in this passage. And they are awesome. Okay? Both of them are awesome. The first one is this. We have to understand that Habakkuk is hearkening back to a Babylonian myth. 
he is reminded of a Babylonian myth. And like the prophets had used Babylonian myths or, or Canaanite myths or Assyrian myths and used them and weaved them into their prophecies, uh, so uh, Habakkuk is doing that as well. And this Babylonia, uh, Babylonian myth is called Enuma Elish. It is literally the Babylonian account of creation. But part of this is being used for a purpose. And uh, I'm going to quote the uh, IVP Bible background commentary, which is, uh, which is so excellently uh, putting this in context. Notice what God is doing here when he uses this backdrop of the Babylonian myth, right? It says this uh, in the commentary. As can be seen frequently in Isaiah and Ezekiel, the prophets often make use of familiar mythological imagery or tales in order to convey their message. In Isaiah 27 and Ezekiel 32, familiar myths are turned into oracles against real nations in real historical contexts. Habakkuk uses this technique uh, as he interweaves elements from Babylonian mytholo mythology into his hymn. The general flow of this chapter shows some similarity to the Babylonian Enuma Elish. In that, uh, in that uh, myth, uh, they, uh, they speak of Marduk's praise being sung. And that's first. Marduk's praise is sung. Then he acquires... Now, Marduk is the god of the Babylonians. Like, this is the main god that the Babylonians worship, right? So, Marduk... Uh, his praise is sung, then he acquires weapons, and his weapons are actually similar to the list that we see uh, in, in this scriptures as well. And he rides on the storm with assistance by his side, and the enemy is split open and crushed. And this sequence is not unique, though, to the Enuma Elish. In fact, it was in many uh, ancient mythological tales from different cultures as well. But it shows the intention of Habakkuk to adopt these well-known motifs and transform them to new use. So here's what God is doing through his prophet Habakkuk who is writing. Literally, he's taking this form of this Babylonian myth from this, this nation who is captivating uh, Israel and captivating Judah and, 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 and overtaking them and destroying them. And he's basically telling this story as uh, through God's perspective of how God is going to overcome and destroy them exactly as they thought their God would do. And so it's, it, it's an irony for the Babylonians basically saying, guess what, God's coming for you, right? And he's using uh, their own devices and turning their own sins and their own stories upon their own head. And so it's a powerful foundation uh, for our understanding of this chapter. But we also need to understand the second foundation. The second foundation is Deuteronomy chapter 32 and thir 33. Now, anybody love, uh, like, extra credit? Like, you were that super student in, in uh, school who was, like, always like, Oh, teacher, please let me get a better grade. Please let me raise my grade to the next level. Is there extra credit, right? And all God's people said... <laughs> Right on, right? We love extra credit. Who doesn't? All right? Exit, or Deuteronomy 32 and 33. Go read it. Uh, that is extra credit for you because it gives the foundation. And, it, and in fact, we don't have time this morning, but there is so much in this chapter that, um, uh, that Habakkuk is grabbing from the song of Moses and from the challenge to God's people. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and 33, um, chapter 32 is Moses' song uh, to, uh, uh, to the, the, the children of Israel. Uh, the, the first generation Israelites have now passed away in their wanderings in the wilderness. Forty years have gone by and now their children are ruling the day and living as the Israelites. And, and, and Moses is recounting the faithlessness of their fathers. And he's saying they turned away from God and they worshiped other gods. And God brought other people, other nations in to fight against them. And God brought pestilence and plague in them to punish them for their sins, right? And over time, God brought them into this place of, of, of discipline out in the wilderness. And yet he's saying, but God in the end will protect his, preserve his people. 
God will be faithful to his people in the end. So while the fathers were faithless, God is faithful, so be faithful to him. And so he gives that song, but he's also giving in chapter 33 blessings for Israel. And he's going, can I remind you of God's heart for his people? And he goes tribe by tribe by tribe. And all the blessings that God has for his people when they follow him in repentance and faith. When they turn away from their sinful ways and they trust in him and his name alone. And God says there is blessing for his people. And, and he says, remember that. Remember that the God who goes with you is a God who will protect you and a God who wants to bless you. And that's the God we serve. He's not the angry ogre except when you sin and continue in that sin. Then that God needs to bring punishment because he's a loving father. He needs to bring uh, justice and judgment and wrath to those who do not repent because he is a holy God and must act in that holiness and that love. And so, friends, those are the two foundations that we have to understand are running behind Habakkuk chapter 3. And so, yes, will, God, will a holy God show mercy to sinners? Yes, he will show mercy because God is a majestic warrior and a merciful Savior. Now, let's see this majestic warrior in, uh, in the scriptures itself. We're, we're going to see God come on the scene, the appearance of this great God. Verse 3 says this. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. Now, friends, that's a, that's a pause, right? Selah is a pause, and, and God just says, God came from Teman and from Mount Paran, right? And, and, and if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, it actually says that that is a reference to God coming down from heaven to Mount Sinai where he met his people, where he called them his own, and where he met them and introduced himself to them, right? And it was, a, it was an awesome sight to behold. The mountain was filled with smoke. There was thunder and there was lightning. There was fire. It was a very fearful thing as they recognized the holiness of God and the power of Almighty God. And that God was their God. That God was on their side, but he wasn't a God to be trifled with or just to play around with. He was a God who needed to be respected and revered as the holy God overall. And so it says this, His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. God was like the sun. He was so amazing in his beauty and so radiant in his glory that his glory shone throughout. And when God came down, they saw great radiant uh, beams of light. They saw uh, the entire sky fill with light and the glory of God lit up the entire sky from one end to the other. The entire earth was filled as these rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Now, if you read Exodus 19, you remember uh, the Israelites at Mount Sinai, you go, well, it seemed like there was quite a lot of power going on. I mean, God is shaking the mountains. There was earthquakes, and there was lightning coming, and crash. I mean, everything. That seems very powerful, and yet, like the sun, in all of its power, sometimes it can, it can burn so, uh, so intense that we get 98 to 100 degree days that you have to cancel everything, right? Because we're, we're, it's too hot, right? And you're like, that's a lot. But here's the reality. The sun in its true power is veiled to us, is it not? Because the sun has the power to destroy all of this. And the closer we get, if we get too close to that sun, that power would consume us. So the, the power of the sun is actually veiled to us, the full power. And in that same sense, when God came down, he veiled his full power. We have never even seen the fullness of his power. In fact, we've, we've, I don't even think we've seen 1% of his power when we saw it in the scriptures in any, in any instance whatsoever. 
He's a majestic warrior. Notice what it says here in verse 5. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. Now, we're hearkening to the exodus now. And, 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 and remember, Habakkuk is remembering the deeds of God. And how God sent plagues and pestilence into Egypt to bring out his people. To wipe out all of the other gods of Exodus or all the other gods of the Egyptians, and to help his people exodus from Egypt, and to bring them out from their slavery. And the majestic warrior goes before them with pestilence and, and plague followed at his heels. Verse 6, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Uh, then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of cushion in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did not uh, or did tremble. And he's basically saying, with cushion and and Midian, he's saying the tribes that were on the west of, uh, of the Nile and the uh, tri or excuse me, the west of the Red Sea and the ones that were on the east of the Red Sea, like everyone heard of your glory. They remember when you came down and you split the sea. And they remember hearing the deeds you did in Egypt. And they remembered even, they heard about you shaking the world and shaking the earth when you came at Mount Sinai, right? His power was so powerful that God shook the earth, right? I mean, think of it, any, anybody you, when you were young, anybody own an ant farm? If you did, you were blessed by your parents, Right? Because those were like the coolest thing. Now, I look back at it, and I remember when my mom let me have an ant farm, right? Um, I, I can't believe she did that, right? She had six kids running around the place, right? And one of them got an ant farm, a, 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 a plastic box that held a bunch of sand and a bunch of ants, right? And in this box that could be easily broken, she entrusted the world to me. Because that could have started an entire ant farm in the house. But if you remember the ant farm, right, there's this little picture, right? What happens, right? You, you, you put in, the, put in the, uh, uh, the sand, and then they, they put in the ants, and what happens? The ants go to work, don't they? And you get to watch day in and day out as these ants are starting to build their little, their little uh, uh, tunnels and passageways, and they build their home within your world, your ant farm world, right? And I'll tell you, I was a bad kid. Not, not one who had a whole lot of compassion for ants. Because I'll be honest, confession in church, I'm that kid. I'm that kid. I'm that kid who treated the ant farm like an Etch-a-Sketch, right? <laughs> who took the ant farm and would shake it. I'm like, do over, mulligan. I want to see you do it again. What are you going to make this time? Maybe they're going to make the White House in all of their, you know. And, and they, what do they do? They freak out, takes them a day to kind of revive, and then they come back and they go back to work, right? And they build their little, little tunnels again, right? And, and, and think, of the, think of the power that I had as a little kid over that ant farm. I could totally overwhelm their world. I could shake it up and, and destroy everything. And, and the scriptures are going, God is so powerful. He is so magnificent. He is so marvelous in his abilities that he could shake the entire earth. And it's nothing to him. I mean, think of him taking the entire world. And as he comes down to Sinai, he's going, right? And they're feeling it so much so that the other nations are like, oh my gosh, I remember when the earthquakes came, right? He shakes the world. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. What an awesome appearance of this majestic warrior. But it goes on. It goes on now to speak about his actions in nature. Verse 8 says this. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation. Now again, as we get these things, there are points in, in Deuteronomy where he's drawing upon these stories from Israel's past. He says, you stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. Oh, excuse me. You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. Selah. 
Uh, you split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. And the sun and moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear. Now friends, what we are seeing, Habakkuk is basically going, God, were you against the nature were you against creation? Were you bringing all your anger and your forces against this corrupted creation that was corrupt from the fall? Now here's the reality. The answer is no. No. It's a rhetorical question. It is no. He's not bringing his wrath against nature. He is so amazingly powerful. He is so majestic as a warrior that he is a God who can use nature. And he uses the rivers and the seas and the oceans and the, and the lightning and the fires from heaven. He uses all of creation and they are at his beck and call because he is a mighty warrior. He is a majestic warrior that fights on behalf of his people. And so God's mighty warrior is seen through his actions even in nature. And so when we hear those stories in the Old Testament of how God shook the earth or how God brought forth an earthquake or God used the floodwaters or God split the sea, this is not God doing violence to his creation. This is rather God showing an amazing display of his glorious power and might. And he uses that glorious and powerful might on behalf of his children, on behalf of his people. And he brings it uh, for their benefit. But we don't just see his actions in nature. We also see his actions in the nations. Look at verse 12. He says this. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You get two pictures there. You get this picture of this giant just like marching through the earth, right? And he's just marching through all of the nations. And then you get this picture of this ox, right? This ox that is, that is threshing out the wheat, right? Thresh, threshing out the grain. And the picture is, is that they lay down the grain on the ground, and then they bring an ox to walk over the grain, and it stamps out all the chaff. And it breaks up all the chaff, and it separates the, the wheat from the chaff. And in that same sense, God is this, this great being who is marching through the kingdoms of the earth, marching through the nations as an ox or as a giant, crushing those things underneath. He says, verse 13, You went out for the salvation of your people, for, your salva for the salvation of your anointed. Just go ahead and, and underline that in your Bibles. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. We're going to come back to that. He says, you crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. <laughs> now that's a picture, right? When God fights on behalf of his people, he crushes the enemy, he kills them, and then he puts them uh, in public display, right? He says, I am victorious, and he strips them naked for all of, their, uh, for all of themselves to be laid bare. And then it says, Selah. Again, we've seen three times this word Selah. And, and, and it's the same word that's used in the Psalms. It's the same word that is used in our worship manual, in our prayer book, as, as the people of God. And this, this word means to pause, right? And, and sometimes it comes in weird places in, in Hebrew. And, and in the Hebrew songs or in Hebrew poetry, sometimes it's intentional where it's put. In fact, it's always intentional if you understand how the scriptures come forth. And here's the thing. When we looked at the actions of God in nature, right in the middle was a Selah. And then we're looking at the actions of God in the midst of the nations, and right in the middle is a Selah, right? Because what God is telling us and what God is saying to us is, friends, when, when, when the forces of nature seem to be against you, when it seems like this world is out to get you in the middle of that, pause, reflect, find a moment alone when the anxiety is overwhelming, when the fear is, is, is trembling, and, and, and when your heart is just not able to be quenched, find a moment to pause and to reflect and to meditate on the deeds of God. 
and on the character of your God. Or when you feel like the nations and the people around you, maybe you have enemies in your life or people that are fighting against you, or maybe it's conflicts that you're seeing, or maybe it's the wars in the world and you're afraid they're going to come to our doorstep, or maybe they do come to our doorstep and we are living in the middle of a war zone and we're feeling so afraid, we're feeling so hopeless, and God says, pause, wait. Remember that God is overall. Remember that God is sovereign. Remember that God is a majestic warrior in the middle of the nations. He says, I am a warrior. Verse 14, he goes on, you pierce with his own arrows the heads of his warriors. Again, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 41 and 42, he talks about those arrows. It's awesome. You pierced his, with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. Man, just an, another allusion to the Red Sea victory that God wrought on behalf of his people. And the idea here is that God not only uses the forces of nature, but when wicked nations or wicked people rise up, God is a mighty warrior who was saved his people in the midst of it he is a mighty warrior and a merciful savior remember what it said in verse 13 you went out for the salvation of your people for the salvation of your anointed friends in the midst of the difficulties of the world in the midst of the history of the Israelites and watching all the battles that they endured, watching all the ways in which they seemed to be assailed and affronted at e every time God was going forth. At every time that Israel needed their deliverer, God went forth. And God, in the end, brought a salvation to his people. And so even though God would send his children to Babylon, even though that for 300 years he had been crying with them and they did not listen to him and he sent them away into captivity as a punishment and a discipline and a purifying force to remove the evil from their midst, even in the midst of it, God says, I will never remove my faithfulness from my people. I will continue to fight for you. I will continue to be for you. I will continue to work out my faithful promises and my covenant will be sure. And so God keeps his covenant. God faithfully saves his people. And while all is lost or as much uh, feels lost, God is still saving the day. And he goes out to save his people. A merciful savior saving his people. Even when they get into sin because of its, it's their own doing. God would deliver them. I mean, think about the book of Judges and how many times the people of Israel would turn away. And then finally, things got so bad because God allowed them to live in light of their sin. And he brought in a nation to oppress them. And they were like, God, we need you. We sinned. Forgive us. God would raise up a deliverer and he would save his people every single time. You went out for the salvation of your people. And then he says, for the salvation of your anointed. Do you know one of the reasons God kept saving his people? Do you know one of the reasons God is faithful to his, his, the people of Israel? And why we know that God will continue to be faithful to his people? For the salvation of his anointed. So that that line that cuts throughout all of history... That line that not only uh, started with David and was promised to David, but that line that was also from Adam, the seed of Adam that would crush the serpent's heel, that line of the Messiah would be saved. And God is saying, I'm faithful to my people, not, be, not only because I promised, but also because I'm working out this grand meta narrative salvation that is coming through my Messiah, through Jesus, my son. And I'm saving his line throughout all of these generations so that Jesus can come on the scene. And friends, if you were wondering, where's mercy in this holy God? Where is mercy in this God who could destroy nations such as this and use evil nations, more evil than the ones that he would actually punish? Where is God's mercy? Where is God's grace? Where is his love? 
It's in Jesus. It's in the gospel. And the Old Testament is crying out, saying, the Messiah. And that line of the Messiah was being saved all the while. So friends, how can a holy God show mercy? If he is truly holy and he is faithful to his character, how can that God truly show mercy? Why? Because God would send his son. God was preserving it so that when Jesus would come 2,000 years ago, when God the Son took on flesh, humbled himself, coming from heaven, took on flesh as a little baby, grew up and lived a sinless life here, he would give his life on the cross. And the scripture says that he would make propitiation, he would appease the wrath of God towards sin. He would make up the full justice of God at the cross. And the cross of Jesus Christ is a place where justice and mercy come together. It's where a holy God can still be holy, and yet he can give mercy to those who would repent and believe in his Messiah. That's the beauty of this God. And Habakkuk is crying out going, how can a holy God show mercy? And will a holy God show mercy? And then he sees this image, this line being run for the Messiah. Because yes, God will show mercy. Even though he is holy, God is a majestic warrior and a merciful savior. What a beautiful and glorious narrative of salvation God is writing for his people. And friends, it leaves us with but one response. It leaves us with the response of faith. Remember when I told you back in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, to underline that? And maybe even in your Bible, just write, this is the theme verse of Habakkuk. The theme verse, the righteous will live by faith. And so, friends, the only proper response to seeing a God who is a majestic warrior and a merciful Savior on behalf of his people is I will trust the Lord at all times. I will trust the Lord at all times. Remember what he said there, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, the righteous shall live by his faith. And that in concert with Deuteronomy 22, or 32 and 33, where God is showing and recounting faithless Israel and how God suffered with them and long suffered with them and was patient, but finally brought in judgment against them and discipline for his people. And then he saved them. And he trounced all their enemies. And he defeated all their enemies. And he saved them from their enemies. And then he poured out the blessings that he always longed to give. That's the beauty of our God. And because that, those words, remember, they were written to the survivors. They were written not to the sinful people that God had, God had put to death as, as they were not people of faith. They didn't trust in the ways of God. They had rejected faith and turned away from the Lord. No, no, these are the people that were taken off into captivity. This was the, the remnant that, that remained. This was the people that didn't go and who trusted in the Lord and hoped in the Lord even though despair was coming upon them. And they were looking at everything that they had built, everything that the Lord had done. And it was, in sh it, was in, it was crumbled and in shambles. And they're saying, God, how do we continue in the midst of such destruction? How do we continue in the midst of this? And he says, by faith. The righteous live by faith. And he says, people, you will continue to live. My people will continue to live when you continue to live by faith. So friends, keep trusting in the Lord. Keep trusting in the Lord. Some of you today, you are here today and you haven't put your trust in him. God is a good God to trust. Can I tell you? He's a God who's been working salvation from the beginning. He's been at work planning a grand narrative of salvation and he wants you to be part of that. Would you give your heart to him today to say, I will trust the Lord at all times. Notice what he says, verse 16. This is Habakkuk. Responding, he says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones and my legs tremble beneath me. A anybody ever felt fear like that? 
I'm telling you, if you were in Habakkuk's day, knowing that the Babylonian army was coming to do such things as that, you'd probably be saying all those things. You'd be like, I was probably worse, you know. I had to re, uh, re up on my, uh, on my undergarments, if you know what I mean, because I was so afraid, right? Notice what he says in the midst of the, all of that fear. He says, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. There's a waiting in the midst of it by faith. There's a waiting and a longing for the Lord to renew his deeds, to remember his mercy, and to crush the enemy that is that has come in and overtaken them. He is waiting by faith. He is living in fear. And he's so filled with anxiety, so filled with fear, so worried and longing for the days when there was peace in the things of God. And yet he's afraid now. And he says, so I will wait. I will wait because God is faithful. I will wait because God did it in the past and he saved his people in the past. I will wait because God is saying to me today, he is going to save his people and he's going to save the line of his Messiah. I will wait and I will trust him in the middle of it. I will wait. Verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive tree, fail and the fields yield no food the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls yet i will rejoice in the lord i will take joy in the god of my salvation god the lord is my strength and he makes my feet like the deers he makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments what an amazing song what an amazing prayer that he has given to the people of god that he's passed on to the worship ministry of the day and said, hey, put this to music because guess what? We need to remember these things. We need to be encouraged when evil seems to win the day and when evil is everywhere. And friends, when you are in the midst of it and your heart is filled with fear, you're filled with fear because the evil that has come into your life or you're feel, filled with fear because the evil that's come into your family or you're filled with fear because the, in, the evil that's coming into your schools or into your uh, colleges or into your workplace or into our world or into our social media or into our media or into our government. It, when you see the evil and you fear, the righteous live by faith and it's a patient waiting saying, God, I know that at the end, you will win the day. I know that at the end, I can trust that, God, you will fight on behalf of your people and you will fight for the glory of Jesus Christ in this world. And in the end, you win. And so I'm waiting for that victory. When you're afraid, wait for that victory. And friends, when everything in your world is ruined, do what Job did. When everything was crushed, everything was gone, everyone dead. What did he say? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you may learn to worship through tears. When, when your bank account is dwindled down to nothing, and, and it not only gets to nothing, but then all of a sudden you're not just at zero, now you're starting to get red. Or, or, or when you raise your children in church and you teach them the ways of Christ as best as you can and they turn away from it and they walk away from it and they run away from it to trust the Lord and to worship the Lord and continue to worship the Lord. Friends, one of the, one of the greatest things you can do, one of the faith-building things you can do is continue just to say, God, you are good. God, you are holy. And God, you will win the day eventually. I trust you today. And I'm just going to worship you. Coming to worship renews your faith and it strengthens your faith in him. So friends, trust the Lord at all times. When the doubts creep in, trust the Lord. Or when the questions bring such confusion in your life, trust the Lord. Or when your own sin is weighing you down, continue to trust to the Lord and look to the Lord and seek the Lord. Or when your faith doesn't seem expedient, not very practical, not very well rewarded in this day, trust the Lord. Or maybe when your spouse won't change and the hurt continues and it's not what you had hoped for and longed for or even 
envisioned at that day of your wedding. Trust the Lord. Or when your kids go off to college and you can't even protect them. Trust the Lord. Or when you're investing in your child's life, you're trying, you're doing your best, but you're not seeing any return on your investment. And you're like, man, I'm sowing in a field that is not reaping. Trust the Lord. Or when dishonesty is being rewarded at school or in the workplace or in the world. Trust the Lord. Or when ungodly people are being promoted. Or when leaders or the governments of this community, this state, this nation, or this world fail. Trust the Lord. Or when the world's problems overwhelm you to such a degree and they seem too big, you're, so, you're saying, they are so mighty and so big and I'm just one little me. How can this happen? Trust the Lord. Or maybe when the Christian faith becomes the focus of, your, of persecution in your day, in your time, in your nation, trust the Lord. May the Lord teach us through the life of Habakkuk, through the life that wrestles by faith, that questions the Lord, that brings those complaints of our hearts respectfully before the Lord in faith. May we continue to respond to say, I trust you, Lord, at all times. Can God really be trusted? Is God really gracious? And merciful. I was reading an illustration this week from the movie called The Last Emperor. Anybody see that? It was a movie from many years ago. But in that movie, a young child was anointed as the last emperor of China. And he lived a life of luxury with thousands of servants at his command. And that little little child emperor was asked by his brother, so, so what happens when you do wrong? And he said, when I do wrong, someone else is punished. And at that moment, he demonstrated that by breaking a jar, just pushing it over. And when that happened, one of his servants was beaten for it. Friends, through the gospel of Christ, through the God who has been saving the line of the Messiah so that he could bring mercy and compassion and grace to those who would trust him and turn to him in repentance and faith. Jesus re reverses that, that pagan practice. He reverses that ancient pattern. And, and instead, it's not when the king makes a mistake, the servants are punished. Rather, in the gospel, it's when the servants are punished or when the servants are mistaken, when they make the wrong, the king is punished. Jesus himself is God's demonstration, his greatest illustration of his mercy that he has towards sinners. So why can we trust him that he is good? Because only a good God would still be just and bring justice to bear against sinners, but would provide a way through himself, through the punishment that the king would take on our behalf when King Jesus gave himself at the cross for you and I. Will a holy God show mercy? Yes. Yes, he will. And yes, a holy God has shown mercy. Would you receive that today? And would you trust him today and always? Let's pray.